Praise God. You, you glad you're here today? Yes. Amen. Well, we're going to continue talking about and teaching on uh, experiencing victory through the blood of Jesus. Amen. How many of you made it last week? You were here last week. Okay. So, wow, more than half of you are not, we're not here. All right. So, it's a good thing to come to church every Sunday. I told the folks last week, Sunday is the Lord's day. Okay, that means on Sunday, the number one priority should be to set aside time to worship him, to hear his word, and to fellowship with one another. That's the way God designed it, okay? For the church to function, for God's purpose to be fulfilled, we need to begin to respect the Lord's day more than we do today. Amen? So if you've gotten into the habit of coming to church once a month, every other week, and you figure, I just rest and catch up on things on Sunday. Don't do that. Not your child of God. Amen. Give priority to your time on Sunday in worshiping the Lord, hearing his word. That's how God designed it. Amen. And fellowshipping with each other in the body. All right? You said I can just watch it on TV. Well, you can't, on TV, you can't interact. Okay? You can't minister to other people. People can't minister. There's something God does when we come together. Thank God for live stream. And I know some of you are watching. If you just couldn't make it to church today, that's fine. But don't allow the opportunity to just stay in your room and listen to be the reason you stay in your room and listen. You need to come to church. You need to gather with the believers, okay? The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. Don't make it your habit of doing that. Occasionally it happens, but don't make it a habit. All right? So I hope I see all of you next week too, all right? Don't let this be your once a month service. And it's important for your own benefit. Okay, experiencing victory through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Revelation 12, 11, please. Revelation 12, 10. Now, well, let's start there. That's fine. Let's read together. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the, the what? The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they, who are they? The saints. They overcame him. Who is he? The devil. By what? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So they overcame, the saints overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to, in other words, they were prepared, if necessary, to die for what they believed. Okay? Um, that's important, I think. Too many of us today, we're just in this, and, and it doesn't take much for us to faint or give up, okay? But our attitude should be when we're dealing with the devil, and we're dealing with trouble or circumstances, is, you know what? You know, I'm, if, 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 I, if, I, if, I, if I die believing God and standing for what God said, then so be it. But I'm not going to compromise what God has said, even if it means that i got to give my life for him. All right? May God give you the grace and give me the grace to be willing to actually, if we were ever called to do that, to actually give our physical lives for him. Hallelujah. Say so they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. 1 Peter 5 8. And there Peter is speaking in and again, he refers to a battle that does take place uh, with the enemy, with the devil. And Peter gives them advice, strong advice, exhorts them. And let's read that exhortation and we can learn from that. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. Let's stop there, okay? So Peter says, listen, there is a devil. And that devil is your great enemy. 
He's your great adversary. An adversary is one who opposes you. So while we know that the devil has been defeated, we also need to re realize that he has not yet been bound. So he and his demons are still going to and fro. And the scripture says, they are looking for someone whom they may devour, okay, who they may gulp down, who they may swallow. Uh, they're, they're looking, and this is what Peter is saying, be sober, be vigilant, because the devil is actually looking to see which one of you he can succeed in attacking which one of you can he devour? Anybody wants to be a victim? Okay. So, Peter says, you don't have to be a victim. The reality is the devil is looking, but the fact that he has to look means not everybody is devourable. Amen? So he has to look to see who could he succeed against. Hmm? I want to be one of those that he cannot succeed against. I, I want to be one of those when he comes to me, he says, no, I, I got I to gotta keep moving. You follow me? And I want you to be one of those when the enemy comes, he says, no, I got to keep moving. Amen? You are undevourable. That means no weapon he forms against you can prosper. It doesn't mean he won't form weapons, but it just cannot prosper. Do you want to be one of those undevourable saints? Amen. Amen. So, if we're going to be one of those whom he cannot devour, we're told to be sober, be vigilant, okay? Coming to church every week, hearing the word over and over again is one way by which you are being sober and being vigilant. Right? So, he's saying... The enemy won't be able to devour you, but you've got to take him seriously enough to be sober, to be watchful, okay? And then the next verse tells us even more specifically what we should do so that no weapon he forms against us can prosper. The next verse says, resist him. Say resist him. Okay, everybody talk to me. You're not talking to me. You're just looking at me. Say resist him. Okay, so God said the enemy is real. Let's not act as though he doesn't exist. Now, we don't need to be afraid of him because we can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, right? But we're told we need to do what? Resist him. And then, how do you resist him? It's not by yelling at him. It's not by screaming all night until you lose your voice. Okay? You, 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 in fact, I think the devil likes that because he gets you all tired. It wears you down, right? No, the scripture says, resist him. He needs to be resisted. Don't just ignore him. If you, if you detect the activity of the enemy, you need to resist him. Now, what does Satan come to do? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he comes to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. So he's, he's looking for an opportunity to steal from you, to kill you, or to kill something God has put in you. Mm -hmm. and to destroy something around you in order, ultimately, if he, if, if, he, if he succeeds, he wants to destroy your faith completely, cause you to give up, go back, and say, forget it. That's what he wants to do. But say in the name of Jesus, I overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of my testimony. All right? So now we're told you don't resist him by yelling and screaming. He's not afraid. You, the volume of your voice does not frighten the devil one bit. Hmm? So, really? Okay? Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with raising your voice if that's what you want to do. But it's not the raising of the voice or the yelling and the screaming that frightens the devil. Okay? If you want to resist him and you want to overcome him, the Bible says this is how you do it. Be steadfast in the faith. Do what? Be steadfast. So I don't, I don't need to yell, I don't need to scream, but I do need to what? Be steadfast 
in the faith. And that expression, the faith, is referring to the content of the gospel. Okay? So he's saying to you, be steadfast, stand firm in believing the truths and the promises of the gospel. Amen? Know what the gospel proclaim, has proclaimed, and then take your stand on the truths and the promises of the gospel. Hold fast to those truths. Hold fast to the confession of those promises. And if you do that, you will become undevourable because you are standing on the promises and the truths of the gospel. And the Bible says the gospel, the truths of the gospel, are the, uh, it's the power of God unto what? Salvation. That means deliverance from the enemy in any form. Don't sleep now. Are you here? Okay. So remember the devil looking for who he can invite. He sees you sleeping. He's uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, I see one, amen, who's not going to be, this, who will be unable to stand steadfast on the word because when the word was being preached, she or he wasn't listening. I know some people sleep with their eyes open too, so. <laughs> but this information is for your good. Don't allow the devil to steal it, all right? So, so, so we are supposed to do what? We're supposed to resist him being what? steadfast in the faith. Now go back to verse uh, 8, because I want to show you something. Many times when people think about dealing with the devil, the image that comes to their mind is you're, is you're on the battlefront and basically you're, you're all exchanging blows, you know, or you're in a boxing ring and you're punching him and he's punching you back, and the goal is to hopefully punch him hard enough to knock him down. So it may be 15 rounds of punching. That's the picture we get, right? Face-to-face -face combat. And so some people actually do karate and judo. <laughs> Yahoo! Jay! I'm a kunda. Amen. Because their picture is they're literally engaging the devil in combat. All right? But the truth is that word adversary, that particular word, speaks of an opponent, but it's an adversary opposing you in the courtroom. It is, the, it is an adversary in a courtroom. So if you go to court and you got the plaintiff and you got the defendant, somebody's accusing you and, and the defendant's defending himself and the goal is to get the judge to rule in your favor. Now, so what this suggests is that much, if not all, I always like to leave a little room because there may be exceptions to every rule, but what this seems to say to me is that the most significant battles that you and I ever have to fight when it comes to spiritual warfare, in dealing with the devil, it's not a face-to-face -face combat thing where you're sweating and he's sweating. It's going to court and taking the, the, the guy to court because he is acting illegally. You didn't hear me. He comes to steal, say it's illegal. No, if you're a child of God, it is illegal. He comes to kill something in you, say it is illegal. He comes to destroy, destroy something God has given you, say it is illegal. So any activity of the devil against a child of God is illegal. Okay, but God says don't, if you, don't just sit there and let the guy get away with it. If you observe he's acting illegally and attacking you illegally and trying to take something from you that Christ died for you to have, take him to court. Amen. You know, was appear before the judge of all the earth. What is his name? Yes. Amen. Or bring, bring to the king who sits on the throne. Amen. When there was a con when there was conflict between the uh, the, the lady whose who baby uh, the other lady wanted to sacrifice, you know, they went to the king and the king settled the matter. So if the enemy is accusing you, because the Bible says he's an accuser, right? He's accusing you falsely and, and attacking you illegally. And you, can, and you sense that, don't just sit there. Hey Amen. If, if you rebuke him one or two times, he doesn't stop. Take him to court. And overcome him before the judge. Win your case. Demonstrate to God 
that you have a legal right to what the enemy is trying to steal. Demonstrate to God that you have a legal right to what he's trying to kill. Demonstrate to God you have a legal right to what he's trying to destroy. Provide God with evidence so that the judge or the king can rule in your favor and render a verdict on your behalf. Say hallelujah. Now, now listen to me. Once the judge issues the verdict, when you, when you get the judge to rule in your favor, hmm, even in the natural, the judge doesn't say, now nah, you go and enforce it. No, no. All you got to do is get the judge to find you, uh, 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 to rule in your favor, and to declare the other person guilty. Once that has happened, the judge doesn't say, now nah, go and enforce it. No. It is the job of the judge to now order the other party to comply and to tell the sheriff to enforce the judgment. And so the, fly, the sheriff has a badge, authority, and a gun power. And, oh, you didn't hear me. And if the, 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 the uh, person who has been ordered to comply fails to, the sheriff will impose it. Now, to apply that to the kingdom because I believe it's relevant. When you come into the court and plead your case as a lawyer in the kingdom, amen, you appear in the supreme court of divine justice where, where spiritual cases are settled and eternal destinies are settled. When you come there and you win your case because you have provided the right evidence to God, God the judge issues the decree and commands everything to come in line so that you get to enjoy the rights. And if there is resistance, God doesn't tell you to go and enforce it. He has a sheriff. Say hallelujah. God has his own law enforcement agents. Say angels. angels. Oh my goodness. Say angels. angels. Say holy ghost. holy ghost. Amen. So if there's any fighting uh, that needs to take place because for one, some reason the enemy doesn't want to comply. They, once you overcome in the courtroom before the throne of God, you don't have to go stay up all night still fighting. No, trust now that I have obtained a verdict in my favor. God is enforcing. Amen. The angels are enforcing. The Holy Ghost is enforcing this judgment in my favor. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And all you got to do then is keep thanking God until the manifestation takes place. Amen. Amen. And remain steadfast in believing. Don't, 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 don't veer. Don't, don't. Steadfast. It's one, it's done, and the verdict has been issued in my favor. I've got the answer, and now I'm just waiting for the manifestation. Are you hearing me? Okay. So, you resist him, you overcome him primarily, again, I'm, I don't want to say exclusively, but almost exclusively, our spiritual battles are fought in the courtroom or in the throne room before a judge or before the king. And the way to overcome is to provide evidence that shows that what the enemy is doing is, is illegal and that you have a right to what he's trying to st steal from you, kill in you, or destroy around you. So that means you've got to be skillful and knowledgeable to be able to plead your case. In the throne room, when you find yourself being attacked illegally by the enemy. So you hear the expressions, I plead the fifth, or I plead guilty, or I plead innocent. Amen? And then a lawyer comes into the courtroom to defend you. Hallelujah. So they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. Now, if you keep the image of a courtroom or appearing before the king, and, and you see this as a legal matter that they won and therefore defeated the enemy, then you have to ask yourself, what is the evidence that I need to present to God, the king or God, the judge, in order to secure my rights in the kingdom. Well, here is the, here is the fact. They overcame and the evidence they provided. No, you didn't hear me. I said the only evidence you need. The only evidence you need. Oh, you're not hearing me. I'm going to say it until you act like you heard it. 
I said, when you go to court, you want to have enough evidence to convince the judge. If the case is such, sometimes people have to print a lot of evidence. Okay, I understand, you know, with, 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 with you know, two million pages you got to read and all that kind of stuff. All kind of evidence. But, but when you come before the judge of all the earth or you come before the king that sits on the throne to plead your case, you've got to make sure that the evidence you bring is the evidence that will cause him to rule in your favor. Amen. And what this passage is teaching us is that the only evidence that you need to present in the court of divine justice in the kingdom of God to secure a judgment in your favor and to cause the judge to issue a decree that will come against the enemy and send angels to enforce it if necessary is the evidence of the... It's the evidence of what? It's the evidence of what? It's the evidence of what? Listen to me. When you come to God... To obtain breakthrough, to obtain deliverance, to obtain favor, to obtain your rights, amen, to obtain grace and mercy, the only evidence that is required is the blood. In fact, if you start to introduce any other evidence, you will be given the enemy material to use against you. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Don't introduce any evidence into the situation that the devil can say, you see, God, I told you, I told you, I told you. In other words, don't bring your works. Amen. Amen. When you come to God and you're praying and you're dealing and you're involved with spiritual warfare, you're dealing with the enemy, don't bring your works. Oh, God, I've been good. God, I did this. God, no, 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 no. You, you, you come and the only evidence you need to bring is God. I am going to produce and pro the evidence that Jesus died for me. God says, what is the evidence that Jesus died for me? Here's the blood. Here's the blood. Look at the blood. Look at the blood. In fact, God, you can look on the altar. In the Holy of Holies, you will see the blood. Amen. And if you look at me, you can see I'm sprinkled with the blood. Here, I'm bringing before you evidence, the blood of Jesus. And this evidence of his blood proved that Jesus died for me. And if Jesus died for me, then everything he died for me for, I have a right to. Uh, I, think, I, I, think I, I think I said this in, the, in last week in one of the services. I said we asked the wrong question. When you come to God to pray, and again, there are different kinds of prayers, but I'm talking about the prayer now where we're dealing with adversity, spiritual warfare. When you come to God to pray in the name of Jesus, you ought not to ask, I wonder whether God will hear me. Will he hear my prayer? Because if you ask, will he hear my prayer, that question assumes that God takes into your account, uh, into his account, excuse me, your behavior, your qualifications, how well you're doing, how well you've lived, how many commandments you've kept. You, that assumes that God looks at all of that and then on the basis of your works, decides whether he's going to answer you. Ladies and gentlemen, if God ever has to look at your performance to determine whether he's going to rule in your favor, you are in trouble. Because every time God looks at our works, he says it is as filthy rags. Every time he looks at us on the basis of our own performance, he says there is none righteous, no, not one. So when you start introducing your works as a way of convincing God, you are providing evidence that the accuser will use against you to disqualify you. So when you come, leave your performance out. Don't introduce it. The devil will accuse you. He'll say, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you should have done that. Tell him irrelevant. Tell him objection. Tell him whatever, you know, what, 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 what do they say in court? I object. Amen? That is irrelevant because I am not basing my plea, I am not basing my request for justice on the basis of my performance. So he's bringing it up, irrelevant, objection. Judge, I am not here claiming that I deserve anything. I'm not here claiming I merit it. I've worked for it. No, I've come here and I'm producing only one 
evidence as the basis for my claim. And here it is. Jesus died. Everybody say that. Jesus died for me. Jesus died as me. Jesus died in my place. Say that. Jesus died for me. Jesus died as me. Jesus died in me. And God here is the proof. He died. Here is his blood is on the altar and it's been sprinkled on me. And when God sees the blood, when you present the evidence of the blood, all that God needs in order to rule in your favor is for you to demonstrate in his presence that Jesus has died for you. So the devil said, no, 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 no. God, don't heal her body. Because she didn't do this, she didn't do that, she didn't do that, she deserves this. Say, Lord, here's the evidence. Jesus has died for me. I plead the blood. Amen. God, she put herself in that trouble. She deserves what's coming. Don't help her. Lord, here is the evidence that I have a right to unmerited favor. I have a right to mercy. I have a right to grace. Here is the evidence of blood. Jesus has died for me. Are you listening to me? So every time the enemy tries to disqualify you for any blessing, if you understand what the blood of Jesus is, whose blood it is, and what it accomplished, your response should always be one response. You lift up the blood and you make your case on the basis of the blood. Do not allow the enemy to cause you to neglect the blood, to look for some other way to convince God to move in your behalf. Always come back to the blood. God said to Israel, you apply the blood to the doorpost. And when I see the blood, the judgment, the wrath, the condemnation that you deserve will pass over you. Because when I see the blood, the blood provides evidence that death has already occurred. The blood is the evidence that the sins that you are about to be judged for have already been judged. The blood provides the evidence that the price you were supposed to pay has already been paid. The, judge provides, the, 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 the blood provides the evidence that, that the law has been satisfied. Are you hearing me? Yes. Everybody open your mouth and say, thank God, thank God. For, for the blood of Jesus. Yes. So they overcame him by the blood, by placing their faith in the blood of Jesus alone for their victory and making the blood of Jesus the only basis for their claim for mercy and grace and help in time of need. And the devil has no answer to the blood. Oh, I, I, wish you, I wish you were listening to me. Say, thank God for the blood. Say, I need no other arguments. I need no other plea. That's not just a song. That's the most powerful revelation that you can have. That you need only the blood of Jesus to qualify you for every blessing and to defeat the enemy. You, own, you need only the blood of Jesus to overcome Satan and to, to, to see circumstances change in your life for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Now, if you are a lawyer, you can't plead a case unless you know what the law is. You got to know what the Constitution says so that you can argue your case. Because the other lawyer would try to confuse things, right? So again, what this means is the fact that they overcame him by the blood meant they had a revelation. They knew what the blood had done 
They knew what the blood had accomplished. They knew whose blood it was. Are you hearing me? They understood. They had opened the book. They had read the law of the kingdom. And they had seen all of the rights that they had in the kingdom that was theirs on the basis of the blood. And because they knew what the blood had done by revelation of the word, because they had knowledge of it, they could then stand before God when they were being attacked and they could make their defense on the basis of the blood. So in order to be able to release faith in the blood, in order to be able to, to, to plead your case successfully against the enemy, you got to have knowledge of the blood of Jesus and what it has done. Amen? And you've got to have enough knowledge of the blood of Jesus and what it has accomplished that you are willing to rely only upon it when you get before God. Some of us don't have enough confidence in the blood to rely totally upon the blood. So when we come before God, we bring the blood, but we also try to introduce other things just in case the blood is not enough. But every time you introduce other things into the argument, you are defeating yourself. You are playing into the enemy's hands. You are weakening your defense. You are setting yourself up to lose your case. You're giving the enemy grounds. Are you hearing me to stand on? Because instead of arguing on the basis of the blood, which is what is recognized in the constitution of the kingdom of God, you're bringing in this extra, 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 well, extra, extraneous information that is not helping you at all. Everybody in the church says amen. amen. Good. I will have to have a resurrection service soon. Okay, you got it? All right. So you've got to know the blood, whose blood it is, how powerful the blood, what the blood has done, enough for you to be willing to rely on the blood alone. Because when you start adding other things to the blood, such as your good works, you are weakening your defense. And you know, as much as God loves us, God is not sentimental when it comes to these issues. God, like any judge, must look at the law and look at the evidence and make a decision based upon the evidence in accordance with the Constitution, not based on sentiments and emotions. So coming before God in the courtroom when the devil is accusing you and crying, <laughs> you will touch God's heart. Amen? You will touch his heart, but he's still got to say, okay, provide the evidence, provide the evidence. Come on, give me a reason now to, 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 to rule in your favor. Give me a reason to grant you justice against your accuser. And that's when you ought to be able to pull up the blood. My goodness, and you better say, God, it is written. This is, uh, this, is, this is why I have a right to this. Devil, this is why you cannot succeed. This is why I refuse for you to steal kill or destroy this thing, because here's the, here's the blood. Jesus died for me. I have a right to this. This is illegal. Now you quit. In Jesus' name, you're not going to have this. No weapon you form against me. Are you hearing me? Amen. So one more time, say so thank you God for the blood of Jesus. It's the only evidence, it's the only evidence that I need to present in every situation. To God for victory. That's the only evidence I need to, to, to lift up before the devil to shut his mouth. Because he has no answer for the blood. Because no matter what he accuses you of when you pull out the blood, what more can he say? He cannot deny that Jesus died for you. Shanda. I said he cannot deny that Jesus, the Son of God, died for you. So once you pull out the blood, he has no nothing to say. So that's when he realizes this person is undeviable. Let me go find someone else. And so the, the, the case is this miss. He has to go look for someone else. Okay. Now, since we agree that it's the blood and we have to be able to plead the blood and we can't plead the blood unless we have enough faith in the blood to rely on the blood and you can't have enough faith to rely on the blood totally without knowledge of the blood, let's begin a journey of discovering some of the things that the blood of Jesus has already accomplished that provides you with the legal basis for approaching God with confidence. 
All right? Now, we probably will deal with three or four of them today and then deal with the rest, Lord willing, next week. But here's the first thing I want you to see. I want you to see what the blood of Jesus did uh, with your sins. The Bible calls the devil what? The accuser of the brethren, right? Okay. For him to accuse you successfully, he has to be able to charge you with sin. He has to charge you with a crime that you're guilty of that the law requires you to be punished for. If there is no crime that he can accuse you of before the law, then he has no authority to enforce or to attack you. If he doesn't have a legal right to accuse you, he doesn't have any authority to attack you. If he has no authority to attack you, anything he does against you is his legal. Therefore, when you take your stand on the blood and claim your rights on the blood, he must flee. And if he doesn't do it willingly, the spirit of God inside of you will rise up to your defense because you have declared what is rightfully yours and because the enemy is acting illegally. Say, if he cannot accuse me legally, or let's say it this way, if he has no legal grounds to accuse me, he has no legal ground to attack me. And if he has no legal ground to attack me, when I resist him, based upon the word, he must flee. He must back off. If he doesn't back off, then my goodness, the spirit of God on the inside of you will rise up on the inside of you. And the Bible says when the enemy comes against you like a flood, the spirit of God will raise up a standard against you. Then the spirit of God will rise up because you have a legal right to what you claim. He's trying to take away from you what is yours. The spirit of God will rise up against you. The Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. The Holy Ghost will see to it that no illegal weapon the enemy is trying to form against you will prosper because you have asserted your legal rights. Hallelujah. Amen. So, say, I plead the blood. blood. One more time. I plead the blood. Now, you hear that expression, you hear that expression, and people sometimes just use it flippantly. Um, And not everybody who uses it has a revelation of what it really means. But if, if if you understand what I'm talking about, when you say or when I say I plead the blood, what I am saying is I am taking legal action. I'm exerting my rights under the new covenant that is based upon not my works, but based upon the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen? When I say I plead the blood, I'm saying, God, I am asking you in this matter to consider no other evidence but the blood in rendering a verdict in this case. I'm saying, God, I plead the blood. I'm saying, God, I do not want you to consider my performance one bit. I don't want you to look at what I've done or what I've not done. I don't want you to look at my good. I don't want to look at my bad. I don't even want that to be introduced at all. I want you to consider only the blood of Jesus in making this decision. Can you imagine any scenario where God will look at the blood and render a verdict contrary to the blood? You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. Well, well, let me say this. Maybe it'll help you. The Bible says we've come to the blood of Jesus and the blood of the new covenant, which speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Say the blood speaks. So when you lift up the blood and you begin to declare the blood, guess what? It is not only you speaking now. You are speaking to God. God is hearing you. But the blood is also speaking, and you and the blood are saying the same thing. My goodness. Amen. You didn't hear me. The blood is speaking for you. The blood is declaring blessings. The blood is asking for mercy. The blood is asking for grace. The blood is asking for unmerited favor. The blood is asking for breakthrough. The blood is asking for justice against your spiritual adversary. The blood is speaking for you. And when you come into the courtroom and you open your mouth, the word of 
your testimony and you begin to testify out of your mouth and you begin to say the exact thing that the blood is saying. Now you and the blood are in agreement and the Bible says when two of you agree as touching anything, it shall be done by the Father. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Amen. And so now you are speaking, but you are speaking the same thing the blood is speaking. So you and the blood are saying the same thing as agreement, no contradiction. My goodness, the blood speaks, you speak total agreement. My goodness, can you imagine in a scenario where you are speaking, the blood is speaking, you're saying the same thing before God, and God will not hear and grant you justice against your adversary? Under what scenario can the devil win in that case? Amen. There's no way you can leave that courtroom or that throne room, however you want to call it, without victory. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So when you, when you come like this and you leave, you know the case is won. Yeah. Yeah. And if the devil's still around, say he's coming for you. The sheriff is coming. <laughs> Are you listening to me? And you begin to speak the end result to your circumstances. And you begin to tell that sickness, you're finished. Your days are numbered. <laughs> are you hearing me? You financial need, you're done. Your days are numbered. You problem, your days are numbered. Why? I already got the verdict, man. I went into the courtroom, or I stood before the judge, or I stood before the king, and me and the blood, we testified. Amen. And we said what Jesus had done for us, and all that he had accomplished by shedding his blood, and my goodness, we got our victory. We won the case. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And then you begin to tell your circumstances, look, if you're not gone yet, your days are numbered. Amen. You begin to praise God for the answer before you see it. You begin to praise him because you know it's not your job to enforce the defeat. It's not your job to enforce the verdict. Amen. It's the job of the court. It's the job of the judge. It's the job of the king. It's the job of the sheriff. And my goodness, I told you already, God has his sheriffs. He has his law enforcement agents. You just keep praising him. And the Bible says he crushes Satan under your feet. Somebody said, thank God for the blood. <laughs> so quickly now, let me give you, I just can give you two or three things today and I'll continue. I want you to begin to see what the blood has done because you need to know this stuff and you need to know it enough that you can rely on the blood totally. All right? Now the enemy doesn't want you to know this and if you know it, he doesn't want you to know it enough that you will rely on it completely. All right? But so we're beginning a journey. So I'm helping you to get started on a journey, but I won't be able to take this journey for you. You've got to take it yourself. Amen? It's a journey of knowing Jesus and knowing the blood. I wish Ace was here, but Ace was in the first service, and Ace has my, my book, Moment of Grace, and my goodness, every page is marked. He got these stickers in it. He got notes. I said, this is how you read a book. This is a man who wants to know. This is a man who's been watchful and vigilant. Because he knows that verse is real. Are you ready? Here's the first thing you can know and have confidence. And when you go before God and you're, you're, you're lodging your complaint against the enemy, hear me, this is something you need to know because when you plead the blood, you need to be understanding that this is one of the reasons the blood is so effective and why the only evidence you need is the blood of Jesus. Here's the first thing the blood does. Say the blood, blood. Purchase, purchase my freedom from the law. The, the blood does what? It purchase, it, it pays the price to set me free from the law. Go to Ephesians 1, 7, please. Ephesians 1, 7. Let's read that together. In him, we have what? Redemption. Redemption, that's a price paid. In him, we have what? Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Go to Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were, everybody, still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by the blood, we shall be saved from wrath, from punishment through him. Now all of this is legal term. Justification is a legal term. This is a courtroom term. 
In other words, you and I were once guilty. In fact, we were, we were once in prison. We were under the judgment and the condemnation of the law. We were in prison because of the sins we had committed. We had been declared unjust, unrighteous. And we were on death row, eternal death row, waiting for the time when not the electric chair, but hell will be open for, to receive us. And then one day, Jesus, say hallelujah. I said Jesus. I said Jesus. Amen. The high priest of a better covenant. He understood the law. You see, Jesus had the power to break us out of jail, but God doesn't operate illegally. So it's not a matter of whether God can do stuff. God can do a lot of stuff that he won't do because it's not legal. You hear me? This is a kingdom. There are laws, right? And according to the constitution of the kingdom of God, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. If there's a capital crime and sin is a capital crime, the only way for justice to be satisfied is for life to be given for life. So Jesus knew we were all going to hell. And that's where we were going to spend eternity unless he could meet the demands of the law and provide an acceptable payment that will satisfy the claims of justice against the sinner. So Jesus walked into the divine courtroom in the kingdom of God, the Supreme Court, amen? And he provided, he, he appealed our case. And then he brought the blood and he presented the blood and justice was satisfied. Whatever the law had demanded, the blood of Jesus met those conditions. And once the blood was accepted by the law as full payment for your sins and mine, that prison that you were in was open. I used to be a prisoner. I'm not a prisoner anymore. The scripture says it is for freedom that Christ has set me free. The law had me locked up in sin under condemnation, but when the blood of Jesus was presented on my behalf, the justice of the law was satisfied. The prison door was opened. God said, you are free. The law said, you are a free man. And I stepped out, and if you are a believer in Jesus, you stepped out, and now you are totally free free, you're under no law, no condemnation. The Bible says you've been saved for wrath. There is no judgment, no punishment, no penalty in your future for your sins. Amen. Amen. Why? Not because God is soft on sin. God is not soft on sin. God is so hard on sin that he couldn't just forgive people of sin until the price was paid. But now that the price has paid, and not just any price, the price of the Son of God, yes. how can dare, how can dare we allow the enemy to suggest that that blood was not enough and somehow we're still obligated and facing some judgment for sin? Raise your hand and say, thank God. The blood has purchased my freedom. So anytime the enemy comes and he's trying to take something from you illegally, and he begins to say to you, you're under judgment. You're under a curse. If you don't know the law and the, and the blood has, you will, you, will, you, will, you will accept that. And you will just sit down and let him take what doesn't have a right to. But if you know, yeah, devil, all the stuff you're accused of being of, I can give you some more. But here's the good news. Every sin I ever committed, every law I ever broke, has been completely satisfied. Justice is fulfilled. And the devil hears the evidence, the blood of Jesus. Once you present the blood, his mouth is shut. What can he say? The blood, uh, again, oh, I love it. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished, not to be continued. Said not to be continued. This thing is finished. The judgment has been meted out. No more judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no more condemnation, judgment, punishment, penalty, wrath of the broken law if you are in Christ. Why? Not because God is soft on sin. God is extremely hard on sin. That's why he couldn't just forgive it. He had to pay a price. But the price he paid was the blood of Jesus. So precious that never again will the law be able to justly sentence you 
or punish you or curse you for any sin. Amen? So now you as a believer should not sin, but not because you're afraid of a curse. You shouldn't sin because, first of all, it's not part of your nature. Secondly, sin is stupid. Third, sin doesn't glorify God. Fourthly, sin still has consequences. Not judgment, but consequences. And fifthly, sin affects your faith. Hardens your heart. You follow me? It keeps you from walking in what you should be enjoying. Sin will cause you to spend your time on earth wasting time instead of doing what God has called you to do. You make it to heaven by the skin of your teeth, but mine, you could have made, you could have come into heaven with so much more. Say, I hate sin. So, so now let's go to the second thing. So you got that? You need to know that, people, because the devil will attack you on that. If you don't know it, he'll defeat you. When you pray, you won't have any confidence when you pray. If you don't know this truth. So you won't be able to defend yourself convincingly by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So here's the second thing the blood. Well, you know what? That's, that's another verse I want you to see. No, let's skip. Let's go to the second one. Here's the second thing the blood does. It purifies us. It purifies us by washing away our sins. And it, wash away, it washes away our sins continually. Say the blood, blood purifies, purifies me in Jesus by washing away my sins and keeping me clean. Now, a lot of believers don't have, don't have a revelation of that. They think you come to Jesus, you confess you're a sinner, you receive salvation, he forgives you all your past sins, but then as you go forward, all those sins you're committing, because how many of you know we still commit sins? Amen? It's coming right back on us. And, and so until we confess them, we are dirty. Right? Because a lot of people believe the only sins that get washed away are the sins you remember to confess. But let me tell you something. If the only sins you remember to confess are the ones that are washed away, I'm looking at some very, very dirty people this morning. <laughs> Let's be honest. You have committed far many more sins than you even know. And if the only ones that get washed away are the ones you remember to confess, my, we are living in a perpetual state of spiritual filth. And the Holy Spirit is living in a temple that is dirty. But how many of you know that the blood of Jesus didn't just come to take you out of prison. The blood of Jesus didn't just come to put an end to the penalty of sin. The blood of Jesus came to take away sin. Are you hearing me? Amen. To solve the sin problem. And so one of the things we learn is that the blood of Jesus will literally cleanse us. Go to 1 John 1, 7. Are we ready to read this? Let's read it together. But if we walk in the light, the walk in the light is to walk in the revelation of the gospel of who Jesus is. That's the light. Okay? Now, somebody reads this. So to walk in the light means not to live in sin. Well, if it means not to commit sin, then why is the blood cleansing me from sin? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from what? Or sin. Amen? So, it, to walk in the light means I'm walking what? In the revelation of the gospel. Of all that the, Jesus has accomplished. I, I believe that. And I'm responding to that. The Bible says, as I believe in Christ and all that he has done for he's the light of the world, as I walk in the revelation of who he is and what he has done for me, I have what? Fellowship with him and, this is the result, the blood of Jesus Christ does what? God's Son cleanses us from what? From what? Your past sins. Just the one you, you no, no. What does, what does A-L-L mean? Some? Most? Oh, why can't we just take the Bible and believe it? If I am walking in the light of the revelation of who Jesus is, the blood of Jesus cleanses my spirit from all sin. And that word is continual tense. So the blood is continually washing me. The picture you should have is of a waterfall where the streams keep flowing continually and washing away so that no dirt is able to stick on the rocks because the water continually flows. 
You see, once you get in Christ, the, the effect of the blood of Jesus upon your spirit is that it keeps your spirit clean. Amen. Amen. So right now you're standing here and, you know, we shouldn't sin for all the reasons I told you. But guess what? My spirit is as clean as clean can be. And it had nothing to do with me. It had, nothing, it had everything to do with the blood of Jesus and my faith in his blood. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So now, when you come before God with this revelation, you come before God thanking him that the blood of Jesus has purified you. So pleading the blood will say, Father, I just thank you that by the power of the shed blood of Jesus and the blood sprinkled on the altar, I come into your presence clean, washed, pure, holy. Oh, what can wash away my sins? It's the blood of Jesus. Thank you that the blood keeps me clean, oh God, before you. Are you, are you here? Say, so thank God that the blood of Jesus washes away my sins. Let me, let's read another uh, chapter and verse to confirm this. Revelation 1, 4 to 6. Revelation 1, 4 to 6. All right, John, the revelator, is, is speaking as he is seeing things in the heavens. Let's read it together. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. What a powerful sight. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us, washed us, washed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. This is the heart of the gospel. This is what separates the blood of Jesus from the blood of goats and bulls. Because those sacrifices could only cover sin. Sin remained. And that's why the Bible says, God said, I take no pleasure in these sacrifices. Why? Because all it did was cover sin, but sin was still there. God was looking for a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice that had the power, not just to cover sin, but to remove it, to wash us and to make us clean. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the, the fact in the Constitution, written down, not one jot and tittle would pass from God's word. Forever, O oh God, your word is settled in heaven. I present to you the incontrovertible fact that the blood of Jesus cleanses you and has washed you from, from all of your sins. That's the only thing in the universe that can cleanse you from sin. There's no other solution to sin but the blood. But once you confess Jesus, he applies the blood. He washes you. You don't wash yourself. You confess him as your Lord and Savior, and he takes his blood, and he cleanses you, and he keeps you clean. Somebody ought to say, I love Jesus. Somebody ought to say, I love that man. Now, that is true. If you're going to rely on that, it has to be a revelation. You need to meditate on this. You need to get this in your spirit. And you need to be able to stand on this truth when the devil is accusing you and attacking you illegally. Because it is this kind of revelation that will cause you to overcome him. No matter what you're hearing, no matter what you're saying, no matter what you're feeling, because you look at yourself and you don't look very clean. And, if, and the devil will show you all the things you shouldn't do. Or you have done. You got to say, yeah, 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 yeah. But the blood of Jesus has washed me. Amen. Your spirit is clean. Now you got some stuff you got to deal with in your soul and your body. But it's your spirit that God inhabits and fellowships with and communes with. Are you hearing me? Now, there is a scripture in James, and we won't have time to get to it today, but James does say, confess your faults one to another. Pray one to another that you might be healed. But you got to understand, 
what James is talking about is not confessing sins in order to be restored in your relationship with God. It's not about that. He's talking about confessing or admitting sin in order to be released or to be delivered, set free to experience liberation from the power of sin. Okay? So, for instance, if you're in bondage and you find yourself, I'm always fornicating. It seems like, seem like I just can't get over fornication. Or I lie. Or I find myself always being envious or just control, uncontrollable anger. Right? What you need to do is to be liberated and set free from that. Now, now it, that has nothing to do with your relationship with God because that's forgiven. But it's affecting you. It's affecting your relationship with people. It's robbing you of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of what God wants to do through you. So a lot of bad things are happening to you, around you, because of this sin, which is evil, right? And you want freedom from it. Well, one of the ways you do that is you don't hide it. You come to a believer and you say, listen, I've been struggling with this. Bring it out to the light. And we pray about it. And we trust God so that we can experience liberty and freedom from the power of that sin. So, it's, it's, so you confess it for your good to, to, to bring freedom to you from the sin that you're struggling with, but not restoration be, because your sin is breaking fellowship with God because your sin is not if you're in Christ Jesus. Okay, so let's go to the third thing and then I'm going to have to, I, I, I'll stop. Then I'll continue next week. Okay? Now sin, sin purifies you, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> the blood of Jesus purifies you. The blood of Jesus purchases your freedom from, from the law. It purifies you from sin itself, keeps you holy and clean. But here's the third thing, and I'll, I'll share this and I'll stop. The blood of Jesus puts sin away or puts sin completely out of the mind of God concerning you. Now, this is the one that we struggle with. So look at me, because the devil doesn't want you to know this truth. Because you need this stuff when you go to the courtroom. And if you know it and you believe it, man, your prayers will be so much more powerful and effectual. Okay? The blood of Jesus puts sin away out of the mind of God all together. What am I saying? Well, I'm going to show you the verse. But I'm telling you, when you come to God in Christ, and God is dealing with you in Christ, God does not have your sins on his mind. You may be having it on your mind. He doesn't. The devil wants you to think that when you come to God, God, the first thing God wants to talk to you about are your sins. And what God wants to do is to deal with you as a sinner. That's the last thing God wants to do. When you come into the throne room, God wants to deal with you as a son. Amen? And he wants to fellowship and commune with you. He doesn't want you to, want you to come into his presence to talk about, your, about sins. In fact, if the sins weren't already dealt with, you could never even get to his You got to be clean before you get into his presence. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. No, yeah, verse 10. We'll read from verse 10 to verse 12. Go to verse 10. I want us to read the whole context. Hebrews 8, 10. Are you, are you, getting, are you getting something out of this? Yes. Am I helping you? Yes. You ready to read? Okay, this is going to sound so new to some of you, you would think I'm preaching heresy, but it's the Bible. Amen. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me say something. I always got to be careful what I'm saying here. Okay? Because when you hear me say that, you may think I'm saying it's all right to sin. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the solution to sin is the blood of Jesus. And by you focusing on sin and God focusing on sin doesn't solve sin's problem. This is what the Bible says in Colossians. The Bible says, this is what the Bible says. If you then be risen with Christ, set your mind on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let me ask you something. Are your sins above? 
Are your sins seated at the right hand of God? So if you obey that scripture, when you come to God, what are you going to be setting your mind on your sins? No, if you set your mind on your sins, you're setting your mind on things below. The Bible says now that you're born again and Christ has shed his blood for you and your sins have been paid for and you have been purified by the blood, when you come, God says, all I want you to do now is set your mind on things above. You want to set your mind on Jesus, who is above? Set your mind on the blood, which is above? Set your mind on God, which is above? And you know what happened? If you will set your mind on Jesus and on the blood, you won't want to sin. The reason you sin and you struggle with sin is because you got your mind set too much on things below. The more you focus on your sins, the more you sin. Are you hearing me? If you would take your eyes over your sins because you believe God has dealt with it in Jesus, the blood of Jesus has cleansed you, the blood of Jesus has purchased your liberty. Now, Lord, I'm free because of what the blood of Jesus is to set my mind on Jesus who is above, on the blood that is above, on you who is above. If I just set my mind on what is above, guess what? Sin will have no dominion over me. You will walk in far greater holiness if you start setting your mind on Jesus and what his blood did than you are and you ever will if you keep looking at your sins, which God has already dealt with for you through the blood of Jesus. Let's read this. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. What covenant? He's talking about a new covenant, right? That's the covenant you're in right now. God is God is doing away with the old. Why did God do away with the old covenant? Why did God say it's not good? It was because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Read the book of Hebrews. That was the problem. It couldn't take away sin. All those sacrifices, there was cover sin. God said, I don't want that. I want sins to be put out of the way. So that there can be nothing between me and my people. I want us to be in a fellowship and enjoy intimacy. And as long as sin is in the picture, we can't have intimacy. And so as long as the law was enforced before Jesus shed his blood, there was a veil. And the veil man, sin has not been dealt with yet. Sin has not been removed yet. Sin is still an issue. Sin is still a factor. Therefore, sin is still on my mind. You can't come. Because if you come right now, you're going to get judged. You're going to get punished. Because I got sin on my mind. So the veil is there to protect you because when I got sin on my mind and you come, I got to judge you. So you know what? I'm waiting for the time when you can approach me when I don't have sin on my mind. So I need a sacrifice that can put away sin once and for all so that you can come and you and I can talk about some other things instead of your sins. All right? So he says, there's a new day coming. I will put my laws where? In their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. Now, let me again. That is, that, I'm sorry, but let me say something about that. Don't be afraid of the message that your sins are forgiven and your sins are not on God's mind. If you get a revelation of that, that's not going to cause you to sin. Do you know why? Because God doesn't just forgive you. I said he changes you inwardly. If you have come under the blood of Jesus, the, 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 what the Bible says, I put my laws is the spirit of God. The spirit of God is on the inside of you. And in the coming of the spirit and in the new creation, on the inside of you, if you are a child of God who's under the blood, you desire to live holy. If you don't desire to live holy, you are not yet in the new covenant. If you say, oh, Bishop say, oh, God it doesn't have sin on my mind. Great, that means I can go sin. In regards to you, sin is on God's mind because you are not in the new covenant. You cannot be a partaker of the new covenant, trusting in the blood of Jesus and have that attitude. Because when you believe in the blood of Jesus, he doesn't only take away your sin, he changes you. You become a new creature. You, you, he takes out that old nature that, 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 that came from Adam and he puts in his own nature. And the nature of a believer in Christ is not one that wants to sin. You may still sin, but that's not your desire. You're not looking for an excuse to sin. There's something inside of you that says no to sin. You may struggle, but you will never condone sin and say, ah, yeah, yeah, as long as I'm not going to be punished, I'm going to sin. If that's your attitude, my brother and sister, you're not in the new covenant, you're still in the old, you're still under the law, sin is still on God's mind. 
Now that it's settled, I'm talking to folks who are born again, whose hearts are changed, who desire to serve God, who have experienced the fulfillment of this promise. He has put his laws and written them in your heart. There's a desire on the inside of you to please God. You got it? All right. So if you now have experienced a new birth and you have this desire to please God, listen to what God said in verse 11. None of them shall teach that his neighbor and none his brother say, know the Lord, for all shall know me. In the new covenant you have, because now the spirit of God lives in you, you can fellowship with God yourself. You can have this intimate relationship. You don't have to come to God through your pastor. Oh, and this is what God was looking for. That sin made it possible. That he had to deal with so that all can know me. In the new covenant, they couldn't come into his presence. Only the high priest once a year. All of them could not know him. But in the new covenant, because the blood of Jesus has dealt with sin. Say hallelujah. All of us who are in Jesus can know God for ourselves. That means you can have a personal, intimate relationship with God. You can draw near. You can enter the whole of holiness. Are you hearing me? The blood of Jesus makes that possible. Verse 12. Now, this is what I wanted you to see. Look at this, because this is the heart. This is the difference between the old and the new. And this is because of the blood of Jesus. The only reason this is true is because of the blood. And you need to know this. But the blood has been shed, therefore this is true. Let's read it together. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. I, okay, in the Old Testament, he says, I will visit the, the iniquities upon you. What to the what? Third and fourth generation. So he wasn't being merciful to unrighteousness there. But it's because he was remembering their sins. But now he says in this new covenant because of the blood, I will be merciful. What, what does mercy mean? Mercy means I'm going to withhold from you the judgment that you, that you deserve. In the new covenant, I'm withholding from you the judgment you deserve for, your, for the broken law. I will be merciful to your unrighteousness. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will do what? I will remember every time they come. Every time they show up in the, in the, before me, the first thing we've got to talk about is their sins. I've got to tell them how they've been sinning all day. He says, I will do what? Remember. You know, it's interesting. When you read Hebrews chapter 11, there's a list of all the heroes of faith. And it's amazing how there's no mention of their sins. You read about Abraham. You know what Abraham did, right? No mention. You would think Abraham was perfect. David, you would think he was perfect. Rahab, you would think she was perfect. And you know they were not. Even, you know what? God, Lot is called a righteous man. When you read the Old Testament, you see Lot's sins. You come in the New Testament, no mention. If you didn't read the New Testament, you would never know Lot had ever once broken one law. Why? God said, I'm not going to remember your sins in the New Covenant. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. I will remember your sins no more. So now you come into God's presence and God looks at you. And what this really means is God doesn't have your sins on his mind. He said, but Bishop, doesn't the Bible say God disciplines us? Yeah, I've told this to you before, but let me say it again. Hey, Barry, how old is your son? 11. So when are you going to let him drive? She said, hmm. Okay, let's assume at 16, he starts to drive, okay? I know before he gets that car, they give him the key, they will give him instructions. Obi and Barry will sit down and say, listen, my man, we're trusting you, but you need to respect the rules. Don't drive over the speed limit. In fact, drive below the speed limit, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, mom. Yeah, daddy. And they get the car. Uh, he gets the car. And a week or so later, Barry is at McDonald's <laughs> or wherever she goes. And she just sees this car. It happens to be a blue BMW. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's... But he sees this car in a 30 miles per hour zone, and it's going at 75. And then he got some friends in the car with him. 
If Barry's car is too old, she cannot chase him. If, if, if she tries to chase him, she won't be able to catch up with him. Amen. So she waits until he gets home. And as soon as he gets home, she says, look, bring your keys. <laughs> now let me ask you something. Did he break the law by going 75 miles per hour? But when he comes home, does she have a ticket waiting for him? Does she say to him, my man, you're going to court. You're going to pay so much for exceeding the speed limit. We're going to charge you with points, and the insurance could go up. Does she does do any of that? Huh, she's not his judge. She's not dealing with him as a lawbreaker. She's not concerned about punishing him for a crime. That's what a judge should do. But she, that's not her role. But she will discipline him. That boy ain't getting that key for a while. <laughs> Right? You say, okay, you know what? You're not going to, I can't trust you right now. If I, if I give you this key, you're going to end up hurting yourself, killing yourself, or killing somebody else. I love you too much for that to happen. So until you grow up, I'm not going to give you the key. So as a mother, she will discipline him and correct him for his good. But she will not treat him as a criminal that needs to go to jail again. She's not going to deal, she's going to deal with him as a son that she loves enough to die for her. You understand? So when you and I who are now forgiven, wash the blood of Jesus, we act, play the fool. And we do things that we've got no business doing. God will still correct us, but not as a judge dealing with sinners. It will be like a father dealing with sons and daughters. And not to punish us, but to protect us from our stupidity. And to protect other people who we're going to hurt. Because your behavior affects your, 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 your children, your spouses, the people you interact. You, you're causing a lot of destruction. And so God intervenes to protect you protect people. And he corrects you, but not as a sinner. He's not charging you with any sin because your sins have been paid for. Amen. Somebody say, thank God for Jesus. So, so, <laughs> say, 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 say. God will be merciful to my unrighteousness and my sins and my iniquities. God will remember them no way, no more. Let's look at one more passage. Hebrews 9, 26 to 28. And this will be last and then we'll be done. Let's read that together. He then would have had, speaking of Jesus, would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. So if Jesus' blood was like the blood of bulls and goats, bulls and goats, that couldn't take away sin, he would have, it would not be enough for him to die once. Every time you sin, Jesus would have to die again because the only way you can be forgiven is with blood. God doesn't forgive you because you confess sins. God forgives sins because a blood penalty is paid. This is a legal matter. Did you hear me? Sin is a legal matter that requires blood. So if the blood of Jesus hasn't paid for all your sins, then every time you sin, Jesus will have to offer a fresh sacrifice. But thank God, the scripture says, in this case, his one sacrifice was enough. Hallelujah. But now, say now. That's the day you're living in. Now, once, say once, not twice, at the end of the ages, he, Jesus, has appeared to do what? He has appeared to do what? away sin put away sin from who put away sin from the eyes of God put away sins from the mind of God and the symbol of that in the Old Testament was the people would take the sacrificial lamb they'll confess their sins and that lamb will leave the presence of God and go in the wilderness where signifying that God no longer sees it that was to let you know what the blood of Jesus would do. It would take our sins. Jesus bore our sins, and he went outside the camp. In other words, he was, oh my goodness. He was taking our sins away from the eyes and the mind of God. Behold the Lamb of God that does what? Taketh away or takes sin out of the way. Out of God's way, out of his mind. And that's why once Jesus sacrificed himself, the first thing that happened was the veil was split. In other words, God was saying, now I can look at you and not see sin anymore. Oh, you didn't hear me. The reason for the veil was to keep God from seeing your sin and having to judge you. 
But once the blood of Jesus was sacrificed, God said, man, sins have been taken out of my way. I can now remove the veil. I can see you and not see your sin. I can look at you through Jesus and see no sin. Amen. And don't have to deal with your sins. Next verse. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this one, how many of you know for you who are in Christ, the judgment has already happened? Amen. 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 This was the law. Die and be judged. Jesus came in, took care of the judgment part already. So your judgment has already been rendered in Christ. Verse, verse 28. So, since this judgment, you die once and you get judgment, so Jesus came to take care of that. So what did Jesus do? Verse 28. So Christ was offered once. He only had to die once to do what? Bear. You know, it's to take away the sins. That's what bearing me. To bear the sins of what? Many. All of us, the whole world. To those, to those, that's you and me, who now are in him, who eagerly wait for him, he will appear what? The first time he came was to take away sin. The second time he's coming, the Bible says he will appear a second time apart from sin. Now, do you know what that means? Read the other translation. It simply means he's going to come without any reference to sin. He's going to come without any sin on his mind. When he comes the second, the first time he came, he has sin on his mind. Because he came to give his life a ransom for sin. The second time he comes, he's coming without any sin on his mind. Why? Because he's already taken care of sin once and for all. Amen. 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 So what has he done? By his appearance, he has what? Put away sin. Now, now hear me. Some of you feel the only time sin is going to be put away is when you die. If the only time God will put sin away is when you die, then your death is your savior, not the blood of Jesus. No, if, if, if God had to wait until I shed my blood for him to put sin out of the way, out of his way, in regards to me, then ladies and gentlemen, it's not the blood of Jesus that takes away my sin. It's death. We need to start worshiping death. And thanking death, because death has become our savior. My goodness. God isn't waiting for me to die to put away sin. Jesus died for me. And in his death, I died. And by his death, oh my goodness, by his blood, he put away sin once and for all. This is so true. I hope you believe it. And not only do you believe it, I hope you believe it enough to rely on the blood of Jesus totally. And nothing else. I hope you believe it enough to make the blood of Jesus your only claim for righteousness, for salvation, for favor. I hope you believe it enough that you can approach God the Bible says now we have a new and living way to come into God's presence. And a new and living way to come into God's presence is by the blood of Jesus. That you can come into God's presence knowing, wow, I'm no longer a prisoner, no longer under judgment. Two, I'm purified by the blood. Three, blood isn't, my, my sins have been put out of the mind of God. And when God sees me now, he's not dealing with me as a sinner, but he's dealing with me as his child, holy and blameless. And armed with that truth, begin to pray. Next week, Lord willing, I will look at what the blood does to your prayers, what the blood does to Satan, what the blood does to you, and what the blood does for, to God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Did you receive something today? Amen. Did you receive something today? Amen. Now, if, if, if you really understood how significant this was, every single one of you would get the message. You either get the CD or you download it, however you get it, but you will listen to this again and again and again. Because if you don't, 
nothing would change. 